Our next speaker today is Brooklyn-based, Queens-born artist, Sean Leonardo. Sean's multidisciplinary work negotiates societal, societal expectations of manhood, namely definitions surrounding black and brown masculinities, along with its notion of achievement, collective identity, and experience of failure. His performance practice, anchored by his work in Assembly, a diversion program for court-involved youth at the Brooklyn-based nonprofit Recess, is participatory and invested in the process of embodiment. Sean is the recipient of support from Creative Capital, Guggenheim Social Practice, Art for Justice, and A Blade of Grass. Has, his work has been featured at the Guggenheim Museum, on the High Line, in the New Museum, and he currently has a solo exhibition at Mass MoCA. On top of an already busy year, Sean recently became the co-director of Recess, which I mentioned earlier, an organization founded by Allison Friedman Weisberg in 2009, whose mission is to create a more equitable arts community. They do this through artist-led residencies, educational programs, and community workshops. We're really excited, Sean, to see what you and Allison are gonna cook up in 2021. And we're so grateful to have you here today. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure, Melissa, and, and I'm so happy to follow uh, Kemi because anything I might provide is going to be in complete synergy with everything that she just offered. So uh, let's get into it. Cool, cool. So you've talked a lot about the need to develop ecosystems created, uh, committed to social change and not limiting our thinking to specific projects and people. So question is, how do the arts best position ourselves as that preeminent ecosystem that can accomplish that task? And how can we best develop, organize, and fund that ecosystem? Yeah, so let's back up and, and clarify what is meant by ecosystem. And so the question that I would follow with is, particularly for funders, what would it look like to support the action of change rather than the institution that is purporting to enact the change? And so in other words, what would it mean to fund a neighborhood? What would it mean to fund a partnership? What would it mean to fund a relationship? And so quite often what I've seen and have experienced both as an artist and in the administrative area is when funding flows through or is a channel through particularly a larger institution what you will see is that that effort is then contained into a community engagement initiative or office or position of some kind. And then what inevitably becomes the result is the result then is that there's a hierarchy that is reestablished in how money flows and what gets prioritized. And so instead, what would it mean for partnerships to all share in the, in the equity of where that funding is allocated? And what would it look like for the publics, the participants to be centered in those initiatives? Meaning that the funds prioritize their wellness and their well-being, as Kemi alluded to. And that's a completely different way of thinking about how we currently fund our system and moving away from the sense of uh, what's been normal for us for a long time, which leads me to refer to something you've said um, to us at the Arts Funders Forum, that leaders and thinkers should consider how returning to normalcy as we once held is a return to inequity. And I've been thinking a lot about this since the election. And people have been saying with a new administration, there'll be a return to normal, some normal rhetoric, and with the vaccine news that's going around that we'll have this vaccine and everything can go back to normal and this focus on going back to what was normal. And I'm wondering what that line of conversation means to you, how that resonates with you with an artist. And if you can tell us a little bit more about this idea of normalcy, how you're wrestling through it and how we need to move through it um, as a society and within the arts. <laughs> This is what I wanna say. We should all move through the world questioning whether, if we know what's best. We should get more comfortable in questioning ourselves, particularly if we're 
and I can say this now as a, as a co-director of an institution, we should always question whether we know what's best for anyone else. And it goes back to my earlier point. When we have funding that flows through an institution that is then therefore making all of these decisions, it reinforces a status quo in which the institution can claim to be the savior and to know what is most important and necessary for the publics as it identifies. And so in moving away from that type of relationship, what we're asking is for a much longer haul effort in which people situate themselves in the discomfort of relationship, of what it means to know, but what it also means to create a situation in which what is centered and prioritized is a sense of belonging. And that goes for more entrenched socially engaged practices as it does for a painting that is on a wall. For an institution and all the individuals that make up the institution to continuously question what it is that they're providing and who they are in the work and to question whether or not they what, what it is that they're putting out in the world is best. And the reason there's such hesitation around that and there has been well before COVID is that that requires a much deeper, longer look at the institution, as, at the who makes up the institution and why people are doing the work. And I know what's coming next, so I'm going to save. I'm going to save what I'm about to say. Go ahead, Melissa. <laughs> I like this. I like this open tag team here. You said something recently in a New York Times Magazine piece, which announced your appointment to recess. I'm going to read your quote for our audience. Okay. As institutions revisit or better analyze the ways they've upheld white supremacist values, the contradiction is that the answers have been there for years. People of color and black people in particular have offered the path forward in institutional change for decades. Folks in seats of power have not ceded their power. And it's a very simple equation. For change to happen, folks have to move aside and actually allocate power to the people. Talk to me more about this with regards to your leadership boards, accountability and reciprocity. Yeah. And so as a continuation of the line of thought that I'm, I'm going on here, the question that I always ask, particularly when I'm in relationship with an institution, again, both as an artist or an arts administrator, I always ask what's preventing an institution from doing the difficult work. Where is the hesitation? But maybe more explicitly, where is the fear? And so when an effort and when funds come subsequently are allocated to an individual that's in a programming role or a particular initiative or a particular program, there's a way in which, and it's palpable for me to assess, that you can tell from the beginning that the work is being distanced from those in the seat of power so that they may remain comfortable. And so what I ask then is where is that fear? Where do we, where does that fear exist within the individual? Because we have to remember, we always look at these institutions as some monolith. Institutions and systems are made up of individuals, made up of people. And so the question then becomes, why is it so easy for these individuals to not implicate themselves in the work? And it really comes down to, in that fear, what are the difficult questions and really challenging questions that will emerge that forces these individuals, particularly in the board and particularly in executive leadership, that will force them to implicate their own whiteness in the decisions that they put forth. That is a much larger ask. And we need to, again, going back to your earlier question, Melissa, we need to go back to this space where we were, you know, in our assessment of what is changing amongst institutions, rather than asking entirely of the institution, we need to ask of the individual, 
what are the stakes for you as a human being? I'm gonna wrap it up, but one last question. Uh, yeah. With regards to your practice, your time, the work you do, what's next for you? What do well, you work? <laughs> what's next for me is, um, well, surviving this week. <laughs> But you know, I, I I will I will give a nod to my re renewed and expanded role at Recess. Um, my hope there is to bring myself fully to an organization and to guide its next stage of transformation as an artist. And I think that was the beauty of the invitation from Allison and the team to not see myself any differently, to allow the questions to evolve and to make sure that my central role there is one of always questioning as we began, always questioning is what we're doing right, which is particularly important in what we do in terms of our stakes in the justice system. But it's also increasingly important in terms of how we are establishing this abolitionist horizon. And for everything that the organization does to point in the same direction. The way we do that through artistic visionary leadership, and I encourage this and I want this and wish this for all institutions, is to allow the artist, the artist as leader, to ask the questions that have not been asked and to not, allow, to not necessarily point to the answers, but to be sure that those uncomfortable questions come into the space and guide any process. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank you, Sean. I hope you and Allison will come back and chat with us in the spring once you've gotten started, hear about what you're doing. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your insight. Thank you for your practice. Thank you for your art. And uh, we wish you well and we'll talk to you soon. Much love.